Thank you, Marianne. Our next speaker is Roman Kozlowski, um, who, with his colleagues from the Polish Academy of Sciences in Krakow, uh, has, uh, have uh, presented a paper called Allowable Microclimatic Variations for Painted Wood, Direct Tracing of Damage Development. Roman Kozlowski. Uh, good morning. Uh, the, uh, at the beginning, I would like to stress that uh, I will limit my talk to damage of the paint layer, of the decorative layer, uh, so I will not uh, comment on damage of wooden support, which is brought by restraint, and we had so many examples of that kind of damage yesterday. So the case I will discuss is... Uh, completely freely moving panel, and uh, we'll just discuss the damage which can be brought by the movement and deformation of the panel in response to the climate fluctuations. Um, and the mechanism of the damage of the decorative layers is well established, and there is an excellent paper which was presented in the previous, during the previous Getty Symposium in 1995 and which is published in the proceedings of that symposium, and I took the first plot from those proceedings. And the reason for the damage is a different response, dimensional response of materials constituting this panel, uh, and the, 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 the biggest difference, the biggest mismatch in dimensional responses between wood and gesso. And this is illustrated by, by the plot. On that axis, you have a moisture coefficient of expansion, which is a measure of, a, uh, of dimensional response of each material. And here we have relative humidity. Now, if we, if we consider the mid RH region, 50% around, we see, first of all, that, as we all know, the expansion is very small. It's the smallest in this region, so the paintings are usually very safe in these regions. And also the, the mismatch between expansion of gesso and wood is small. But if we move away, if our RH increases in the, surround, in the environment of the panel painting, then wood will expand very considerably, especially if the panel is cut in the very responsive tangential direction, but gesso will remain not so much, it's not so much responsive to moisture. So a big mismatch between the, the, the dimensional change develops. And the result, as a result of this, of course, damage appears. This, uh, this film illustrates what happens if... Uh, it works now... Uh, if we increase the rage, so wood is swelling, of course, much more than gesso, as I said, but of course uh, they are not independent. Gesso is strongly, firmly attached to wood, so if the swelling of wood is too big and the mismatch is too, too large, then we will have failure of gesso layer. The gesso will crack because of an excessive swelling of wood. Of course, vice versa, if we reduce relative humidity in the environment of the panel painting and wood starts to shrink. Then, of course, it will shrink much more than gesso. And as a result of the mismatch, gesso will be delaminated because it will be put in compression in this time, whereas during the swelling it was was put on, on, on tension. So the mechanism of, uh, uh, of the damage is well understood, and of course we must ask for the, uh, for the quantitative criteria when, at, at which uh, change of relative humidity or, or at which strain the damage will appear, which kind of dimensional change is safe and which is not. And to, uh, to do this, we must introduce so-called stress-strain relationship. If you take a material and start to strain it uh, in, in a machine, and this is shown, I'm sorry, and this is shown for a piece of wood, 
and this is extensometer measuring the strain, you will have the linear part, which is safe. We, we call it an elastic region, so your material, when it is strained, and, the fo- and then th- there will be no force after it, it will return completely reversibly. But at some point, on some critical strain called the yield point, there will be plastic deformation of your material. This means that the material will not return to its initial dimension when the force is released. So, of course, a very conservative criterion in the conservation field would be not to uh, go with dimensional change beyond the yield point. And for this particular experiment, this is Limewood, the yield point determined with, uh, experimentally is 0.2% dimensional change. Of course, when you increase and increase the dimensional change, you reach finally the point at which the, your material will break completely. So this is the second very drastic point, and it's about 1% for wood. So if we have these two criteria, one, very conservative yield point, we can say anything below yield point is safe, anything above the yield point is it's dangerous, but uh, really very bad critical point is failure point. So knowing these parameters, mechanical properties for gesso, we can determine safe relative humidity fluctuation, which is shown on the next slide. And it's again the slide copied from proceedings of the previous uh, Getty Conservation Institute Symposium. So... Uh, if we start with our panel painting and equilibrate it completely at 50% relative humidity and we increase relative humidity, we will at some stage reach the critical strain, the yield point of gesso, and this will be the, our limit for, for the allowed deformation. And we can see that this limit between uh, both in direction of swelling and shrinkage the limit corresponding to a strain of 0.25, which is the yield point of gesso, is around plus minus 10%, plus minus 15%. So that's safe for this particular RH region. And of course, if we increase the swelling even more, the increase relative humidity and the resulting swelling even more, we can reach a very dangerous strain of 1% at which we for sure have a complete failure of gesso, a crack. So uh, what would our uh, unanswered question, which we would like still to research? Uh, those questions are frequently asked by conservators and curators who take care of panel paintings. First, is really yield point such a dangerous critical strain? Well, it's just the beginning of the formation, so is strain 0.25%, some magic number we we should really take very seriously. And the second question is, we don't have one cycle in the museum or in a historic building like churches, for instance. Our strain cycles repeat many, many times. We can have diurnal cycles, we can have seasonal cycles. So what about the fatigue fracture? We know very well that even small strains repeated many, many times can lead to so-called fatigue fracture. So these two questions I will try to answer or give some experimental approach which will aim at answering these questions. Our approach was first to have a tool to experimental to, to see directly damage development at the micro level because the criterion that we see damage with an, with an eye is not enough. We would like to see when the damage starts to appear. And the second, we would like to produce a fracture, a ex, a fatigue fracture experiment by stretching and compressing mechanically specimens of patent wood so that we can, in the laboratory, uh, run the specimens for a very large number of cycles in short time. We can't do it by fluctuating relative humidity because, as you very well know, the spe- a specimen imitating a panel painting responds to a fluctuation of relative humidity very slowly, for sure for many days, and the real equilibrium is reached after maybe for four centimeter panel after maybe three months. So, so it would be impossible 
to test the panels by really subjecting them to the, to, to, the, to the relative humidity fluctuation. So we did it mechanically to gain, to, to increase the rate of cycling. I will describe this uh, approach more in detail. Uh, the direct tracing of damage development, we did it with the help of a method which is uh, a physical optical method which is called SP, and I'm not going to, to, to now describe this method. I'd be happy to, to, to provide all information for, for those of you who are interested because of lack of time. But just very briefly, SP is able to see very precisely the displacement. So if you have a painted surface and you photograph it using the SP technique, and there is some displacement, like even micro-cracking, SP will show as black everything which was unchanged, which was as before, but the change will be shown in white or gray. So with this optical technique, you will be able to detect directly and very early the, the damage. Uh, SP has uh, one very good uh, feature also. Uh, if you construct it in a portable version, you can use it in the field. And here I'm showing the uh, laboratory portable SP we built, and which was used to uh, make a conservation survey of a small part of medieval altar in the church in Hedalen in Norway. And the idea of an experiment was to see with Espin very, on a very micro level uh, what was the state, state of preservation, what was the damage pattern after summer, before the heating season, because the church is heated in winter, and then check the state of the paint layer after the heating season when we could bring portable SP again to the church and do the same survey of the panels again. So... So the technique is not only the laboratory technique, but can be used practically in historic buildings, for instance. And now uh, about specimen and mechanical testing, the cycling. The specimen was prepared for us by a conservator. It imitated the panel painting. So we had lime wood. Lime is an important support for panel paintings in Central and Eastern Europe, in Germany, Poland. And we know very well that uh, species, uh, one centimeter thickness, because it cannot be too thick, because we must induce cycling mechanically. Then we have glue sizing, gesso layer. And a part of the specimen is covered by a, by a paint to get some more information about the influence of a quite rigid uh, paint imitating an aged oil paint. So we have uh, this uh, um, specimen imitating a panel placed, clamped in a machine, and the machine is stretching and compressing the panel very quickly, and one cycle is one second, so you can imitate in this laboratory experiment uh, dimensional changes of a panel. You, you can run uh, many thousand up to 50,000 cycles, so you can learn about development of damage as a function of a number of cycles. Wait, I can't move the slide, but maybe this does not. Or maybe I do it with the key. No. Can you cut the... Thank you. Yes, I 
Yes, next one. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, I would like to show the short film and uh, visualize how it works. Uh, the specimen is stretched mechanically uh, at a quite high strain, 0.4. We remember that for Jess of the critical strain was 0.25. And on the, uh, on the right photograph, you see the uh, crux as discovered by SP. So as I explained, black fields are unchanged gesso and the, the white crux, you can, you can see them very well. Not, not all of them are visible uh, with, with an eye. And, and here is uh, how. So, so you can see that some of the cracks act as an expansion joints and the cycling is, uh, the frequency of cycling is about one cycle per second. And we, of course, have mounted on the specimen extensometer so we can monitor the very, follow very exactly the strain, the dimensional change of the field investigated. So I would like to show, uh, a, a, again, a animation which, which shows the development of cracking during cycling at a rather low strain of 0.25%. So nothing after 100 cycles, but after 5,000 cycles, there is some small cracking starts to develop. So we know that uh, at this particular strain, the first crack at the micro level, you can't see it, will appear after five, between five and 10,000 cycles. But then you can see that more cracking develops as the number of cycles increases. And this was our maximum number of cycles, 36,000 of cycles, because 36,000 of cycles corresponds to 100 years if you assume that your cycle is a diurnal cycle. So 100 years of diurnal changes is a, is a long perspective for any museum or historic uh, building. So from these experiments, we were able to plot cumulative crack lens. Cumulative crack lens was for us a parameter which would show the accumulation of fracture. And you can see that, uh, the, that of course, uh, here is the number of cycles. Here is the cumulative crack lens. And of course, if your strain is very high, then the cracking will occur after five cycles very quickly. But if your, uh, your, your strain becomes lower and lower, the number of cycles the panel can withstand is very large, and we observed before that for 0.25% strain, the first initial micro crack appeared after 5,000 cycles. Now, for 0.15% strain, we've, we didn't observe any cracking even after 60. 36,000 of cycles, which for us is the limit of our testing. So, so in this way, we could, were able to determine the absolutely critical strain level below which the panel or the gesso layer is safe. And we can uh, create something called in material science as S-N relationship, which is strain at which your material fails plotted as a function of number of cycles, and we are below 0.25% strain. There was no damage, but 0.25% was the, the micro, some micro crack appeared after 5,000 cycle. Well, of course, it's now up to a given museum, a given situation to say, is 5,000 cycles a lot? Is a, is a large number of cycles not? If you have diurnal cycles, so your panel painting experience 0.25% dimensional change every day, then it corresponds to 15 years. So after 15 years of such an instable situation, you will have first micro crack. If it's yearly cycle, for instance, you have a heating during the winter, dry conditions, and then in the summer there is more, more wet conditions, high relative humidity, then of course 5,000 cycles is a lot a lot of cycles because it will correspond to 5,000 years. So in between, you have all situation. Everything depends on the, on the frequency of the cycles. If, if the cycles are repeated very frequently or they are rare. 
So, uh, coming to the conclusions from that research, which is an, a still ongoing research, and I am very pleased to present some first results, really, uh, around 0.2%. We need to do more experimentation to, to get statistical uh, value, to, to get better statistics, but 0.2% seems a safe strain, a cri absolutely critical level below which the gesso layer is safe because no fracture is observed after, after 100 years of diurnal cycling or 36,000 cycles. So Mecklenburg's 0.25% uh, yield point, which, which, was, which was assumed so far, which has been assumed so far as a, as a critical strain, seems right, but we must say it's a very conservative uh, value because, as I showed, we needed... 5,000 cycle to observe first micro crack, so it's, 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 it's a very conservative criterion of risk. Now, how to translate that into allowable uh, relative humidity fluctuations? Uh, as we know from the previous research, of course, from the, uh, from the mechanical properties of gesso, of its uh, moisture-induced uh, response, Strain of around 0.2% corresponds to plus minus 10% relative humidity, maybe plus minus 15%, around 50%, because as we know and as, we, as I showed before, it very much depends where you are with the average relative humidity. If, if you are at 50%, which is a usual, let's say, optimal climate for the museum, so the, the fluctuation, tolerable fluctuation, will be plus minus 10, 15%. But, of course, the, probably the panel paintings, this should be um, researched by computer modeling, by, by, by more work, can, uh, are able to tolerate broader rates of fluctuation because, of course, the panel is unable to respond, if it's especially if it's quite sick, to the fluctuation fully. So the strain the paint layer experience is much smaller because of the response time of the object. So that's one positive factor. Uh, second, usually the panels are deformed. If the panel is bent, it has a convex shape, then the, 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 the paint layer is um, the, the um, re real strain which, which the paint layer or gesso layer experience is smaller because, because some of the strain is compensated by deformation. And, of course, we have also the relaxation of gesso, but only for the long-term variation. Gesso is uh, elastic or flexible material, and, uh, and if, if it's strained, it will relax a bit and it will prevent cracking. So all this factor needs to be taken into account to get probably much broader range of tolerable fluctuation of a range. What next in our project? First of all, we would like... To finish the testing I described, let's call it a simple testing, but we would like also to work with uh, specimens in which gesso uh, will be artificially delaminated. We're doing it by masking wooden support before laying gesso with paraloid and then dissolving paraloid. So we're creating voids, delaminated area in the gesso layer. Because we would like to answer the question, what, how existing damage is uh, influencing the development of further damage during the dimensional changes? Is uh, existing damage kind of expansion joint, is it helping to preserve the, 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 the layer, the decorative layer? Or existing uh, um, voids or delaminated areas are starting point, are, are a fragile, are a risky points at which damage will develop uh, easier than for a solidly attached gesso. That this question can be answered in the same experiments experimentally. And SP is a very excellent technique to follow the, the development of damage. And I am showing here a various, in various ways how you can, with, uh, SP, with SP technique, model the, 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 the delaminated areas. We can very precisely see how the, the, the area delaminated develops we can also characterize mechanically the paint flake or gesso flake by vibrating it and uh, recording parameters of this vibration so we can, we can trace even subtle changes in the, in the damage as, as a function of cycling. 
uh, we would like also to use historic specimens after we, 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 we become quite familiar with laboratory prepared specimens. We've received this historic altar frontal of very little value from conservatives. It was just rejected during some conservation works. It contains square meters of historic gesso with a lot of various cracks and delaminations. So we, we are allowed to cut it and maybe then use for the same uh, mechanical cycling uh, historic just a sample to see how, how the real object, aged object, would respond to, uh, to, to cycling and to various strain levels. So uh, to conclude, I think that the experimental approach used uh, is, uh, is, is a tool which can answer in, in laboratory, some important questions uh, spe- uh, can, can help to assess the, 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 uh, the harmlessness of, of climate conditions in, in the real uh, historic buildings or museums. I think that the important conclusion from the first part of experimentation is that 0.2%, which was the the old value in the old in the mechanism, which is known for, which has been known for such a long time, has been confirmed as the critical state. But the but the as I, as I stress many times, it's it's very conservative. So very little damage appears at this strain after many thousands of cycles. And of course, uh, we hope that uh, we will be able using. Uh, uh, many methods to assess a real strain experienced by just a decorative layer to give realistic arrange, ranges which, which panels can, 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 can uh, survive, can, can survive in a very good shape. And of course the main uh, um, background for this research is to to, to, to get as precise information as possible about uh, uh, realistic needs of an environmental control. Because if we can release a bit uh, environmental control in museums, then, then we will gain resources in terms of saved energy, saved equipment. And of course, also, this kind of research is important for buildings which have no uh, potential for good environmental control, like historic churches, for instance, or historic building in which relative humidity fluctuations are, uh, of course, present because of the nature of the building. And finally, I would like to acknowledge a uh, grant of uh, so-called um, financial mechanism of the European economy area, which is our, these are governments of Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway, who supported us with the grant. And this research was done in collaboration with NICU, which is the Norwegian Institute of Cultural Heritage in Oslo. And Marion Mecklenburg uh, from the Smithsonian Institution and Stefan Michalski from Canadian Conservation Institute are the consultants to the project and many ideas in this research were also discussed with them. Thank you. Thank you very much.